this thing on? All right. So I'm glad everyone is up uh, bright and early. This is the third year doing the conference and my third year talking about at it. Um, so the first year I did sort of an intro and of Backbone.js and an overview um, with some live demos and uh, stuff like that. Let's see. And the second year I talked about sort of my favorite design patterns and sort of the philosophy behind it. And so, you know, talking three years in a row about the same thing gets a little bit tricky, but I remembered that I made a joke the first year that Backbone is a small enough library we could probably do a code review and go through the whole thing in the amount of time I have to talk. And I figured, shit, that would be a great idea for the final Backbone Conf to try to uh, bang through the whole thing. Or we're probably not going to be able to do the whole thing, but at least as much of it as possible. So I have to apologize in advance if this is a little bit too much code in the morning, like uh, eating your vegetables first thing. But we hear that uh, apparently popcorn and soda becomes healthy at 12 o'clock, so I guess we'll get back to the junk food um, shortly. But I think, I think it'd be useful at least getting started to get sort of a, a good foundation of Backbone's internals and how it works, and more importantly, why it does things the way that it does. Um, so in the aim of, of usefulness over perhaps funniness, I think we'll, we'll look at some code. Um, so, uh, right, so I'm calling it Climbing the Mountain. Um, probably be better name would be a deep dive, but I didn't have any good undersea pictures to show you, so we're gonna call it Climbing the Mountain instead. Um, getting off to the top, and I hope this code is, yeah, it's big enough for everyone to see. Um, our, our resolution's a little bit less than, than we thought, but this should work out pretty well. So the first thing you notice in when you dive into Backbone is sort of the way that it has to set up itself in, in context with the, with the global and the rest of the windows. So whether you're using AMD or using CommonJS or you're just using old-fashioned globals, we have to do this sort of rigmarole to get it to work in all three. And you can see what's happening here is um, the bit that's being passed in the, the uh, exports there is the object that Backbone is then going to get attached to. So if we detect that we're inside of AMD, we're going to set it up, we're going to you know, r depend on underscore and jQuery and the exports object and stick it back out on exports. And otherwise, if we're in CommonJS, um, if we have, a, if we have a, a require function that we can use, we're going to pull an underscore because that's the only thing that you tend to use when you're on the server. You don't necessarily want to be loading up jQuery inside of your node web server. Um, but you might want to be using your backbone models. And then otherwise, if it's global, then we, uh, we just use a naked object to stick backbone onto. There's no special um, exports that's available. And uh, we use underscore, and then we fall back to different things that you might have configured your backbone to use with. So maybe you're using jQuery, and if you are, then we use that. Otherwise, Zepto or Ender will do, or whatever you decide the dollar sign um, sort of DOM library should be. So I'd like for this sort of thing to die a horrible death in the future. I think this is a really hideous way for like widely used uh, libraries to have to start. It's just kind of ridiculous. And hopefully with you know modules in this next upcoming version of JavaScript, that'll happen eventually. But until then, we have things like no conflict. So um, if you are working in, a, in an old fashioned, if you're writing a library or even a module to work with regular JavaScript and you're not using a module loader, a really nice thing you can do if you're namespacing everything down underneath your name is provide a no conflict function. Um, and all that that is is basically stashing, I think I have a mouse that will appear, or maybe it doesn't appear, oops. Um, so all you're doing is you're stashing a, a reference to what the previous value of Backbone was before you load your script. You just Take, save that out, and then you add a function that captures it in the closure. And so if they call no conflict, you can, you can get back a reference to this version of Backbone, and you can leave the previous thing that was called Backbone alone in the window. And so that lets you have compatibility. And ideally, you'd never have this. You wouldn't want to have two different versions of the same library running on the same page because it's a waste of bandwidth. But the real world is not the perfect world, and I can say that at the times where I work, um, we have a great, great many graphics on pages where there's maybe two or three different versions of jQuery and two or three different versions of underscore because of different libraries written at different times. And because they know conflict with each other, it's not an issue. Um, so now the sort of the basic core thing getting started with Backbone is the inheritance function that you might be familiar with. So when you extend a model or a collection, um, 
or anything like that. Basically, we have this little helper function that does the basics of what um, of what sort of JavaScript prototypal constructor setup is all about. Um, but you need to do a little bit of a dance because if you're setting up a prototype chain in JavaScript, you have to have a concrete instance of the thing that you want to inherit from. And you don't want to instantiate an actual copy of that instance because the constructor might have side effects. It might be saving itself to the server. It might be going out and touching the DOM. So you need to do this sort of wriggle remote where you make an empty child constructor function, stick the prototype of the thing you want to inherit from onto the child, make a new one of those. That's the surrogate that you see here. And then um, inherit from that and then set your prototype to be that new sort of naked object that has the prototype of the thing that you wanted in the first place. So this is one of the reasons why, I guess, classes um, have been discussed for future versions of JavaScript and are, are still in the works in the design phase, so that you don't have to do this kind of dance. And then the one extra thing that Backbone does here um, when, you ex when you call backbone.model.extend and make your own class is to copy over the properties, the static properties from the um, parent class onto the child so that you get to keep those also and you don't just lose those when you make a subclass. So you get prototype chain pointing to the instance methods and you get the static properties copied over onto the actual reference and then you can go from there. And then you can see down at the bottom how we're adding this extend method. It's just a, it's just a function that we can attach to all of these basic classes to give, it, to give them that capability. So after the basics, sort of the heart of uh, Backbone is the event system. And that's really core to basically everything that it is, right? So Backbone, at its heart, is a structured way to deal with your data and your UI. And, the, and, the, and you can do that both directly, procedurally, by manipulating them and looking at them and writing code that works against them. But then you can also reactively, by listening to events and reacting, making changes, updating your UI, having computed properties, having models change based on the state of other models using um, events. So there's the, to get, before we get into the nitty gritty of how events work, um, there's a little bit of sugar here um, for handling um, recursive sort of calls. So when you, when you call a method on events, when you add an event to listen for something or when you trigger an event, you can pass just the one event you care about, or you can pass a space delimited list of event names. That's what the event splitter regex up top is doing. It's splitting up the event names. Or you can pass a key value hash, with the keys being the name of the events, and then the, the, the values being the callbacks that you want to register. And so all that this little events API thing is doing is it's saying, when we call a method, if we're actually doing more than one thing, if we're actually listening to three events or five and not just one, then we'll recursively call the function that you tried to call in the first place and then pass it the same arguments. So that's all this is doing. It's saying if it's an object, we're going to recursively apply it to every key and value pair in that object. Or if it's a list, if the event splitter is um, a matches against the string, we're going to loop through every single name in there and then recursively call the same function you tried to call and sort of implement it that way. So this is a nice little bit of sugar we can use for all of those core event methods. If you ever looked at this in the source code, we're confused as to what exactly it was doing. That's what it's doing. So now, inside of events, when you bind an event, the first line you'll see there is, if not events API, then you just return. Because the events API thing is what's going to go through and make all of those extra calls. So when it, when it, when it um, returns true and you're allowed to continue because it's a singular call and not a recursive call, then um, basically when you bind a callback to a model, it's going to lazily create the storage for where that callback gets stuck. So, so conceptually, what is an event? An event is a function that um, you're listening to a, an event of a given name. And then when that thing happens, we need to go look through, look up that name on that object and find the list of all the callbacks that have been, ever been registered to respond when that thing happens and then call them in sequence. That's sort of conceptually what it does. And so the machinery of that is you have to build the storage for that. And we don't want to have storage for everything that might possibly ever be called. So instead, you do it lazily. So we say, if there isn't an events hash at all, if nothing's being listened to, we don't even have one. If we do have one, we make an array for the name. And then we push in this new event, which is just an object tracking what the callback is, what the context is. And then the CTX might be a little bit confusing. So the context is the original um, context so that you can look it up later, because you can unbind things by context. And then the CTX is what we actually use, defaulting to this, because we want to have a value. 
but if we just used one or the other of those, then we wouldn't necessarily know what the correct value was when we had to do the bookkeeping later. So we have to keep track of both of those things. And now once is a little bit interesting because it implements itself as an underscore dot once wrapped function. So a function that can only be called one time. And you'll notice how it unregisters itself the first time it's called before continuing. And then it just calls on to add it to that, to that tracking. Now off is a little bit more fun. I hope that's legible. Um, a bit, a bit of a fine mess here. So it does the same recursive events API call to start. So you can unbind multiple events or space delimited strings. Um, and it works by specificity. So the idea here is that when you want to unbind events, you can unbind all the events on an object, period. You can unbind all the events that have a particular callback registered for just that callback. You can unbind all the events for a given context. So you can say everything that this object is listening for, everything that this model is listening for, I want to get rid of anything on this object, um, or any combination of those. So you can be as specific as you want to be with exactly what set of events you want to remove. So this stuff is sort of handling that. So we're saying, I mean, that first case is the quick case, right? If you're not going to unbind any particular event and you don't have a callback that you care about and there's no context, then you're just blowing away all the events. So we set this dot events to undefined and that's it. That's all we have to do. We just blow away the entire storage system. Otherwise, you have to loop through. So we have to say, you know, for which, if you passed in uh, an event, then it's just that one. Otherwise, it's all of the names in that hash. We loop through all of the names and uh, we delete we delete the entire list if there's not a context or a callback. Otherwise, we sort of do the opposite, where we go through each registered handler in turn and we say, is it something that we want to keep? Is it something where either the callback is different or the context is different? And if either of those things are the case, then we want to keep it. And so we just basically build up this new list of remaining events and then replace the existing events with what was left. Um, and if there's nothing left at the end, then it's then we can delete the thing and avoid this entire bookkeeping in the future. So your event system speeds up. You don't, it doesn't get slower and slower because you have more and more bookkeeping for things you're not listening to anymore. It sort of cleans up the bookkeeping after things are removed. Um, so that's removing events. Now for triggering events, it can be similarly recursive. We use that same um, events API sugar towards the top there. Um, and, and you'll see it sort of, it doesn't do very much, right? We're just looking up which event it is and then calling trigger events on that. And then we're also doing it for the special all event. So in Backbone, you can have an all event. You can say model.on all and then have your callback, which means no matter what the event is, it's like binding to star. No matter what the event is, um, it'll run the callback, which is very useful for sort of meta level stuff where you're, where you're delegating your forwarding events onto something else or you want to do bookkeeping and you want to listen to it, find out what's going on underneath the surface. Um, so here you have the little check. You say, if we have anything listening on the all event, then we want to trigger it. We don't just trigger it blindly. We only trigger it if someone is paying attention to it. So what is this trigger events function, you might ask? Well, it's this ugly thing. And uh, now this is, is gross, but it's actually a little optimization. And unfortunately, it actually matters. So the sad, the sad fact is that in most JavaScript engines these days, um, and even more so in older engines, um, call can be faster than apply if you're trying to call a bunch of functions or dot apply a bunch of functions. Apply being the form where you can take any number of arguments in an array, and call being the form where you pass positional arguments. So we're optimizing. We're, we, we know that most callbacks to events, or we're saying that most callbacks to events take, you know, up to three arguments. And so if it's less than, we're saying if it's less than three arguments in the list, it actually speeds things up to manually do the call here than it does to do the apply, which is the default case. And so this is a little bit sad, but uh, it's a nice little, it speeds things up when you have a whole bunch of events firing in a tight loop. Um, and I remember once doing an, a far more terrible and f awesome uh, version of this with case up to 32 going out to the right. And it was actually, we had a formatted as sort of a pyramid getting longer and longer and longer with a little um, ASCII art skier and JavaScript comments going down the side because there was some crazy, I think it was, it was a cross frame bug in IE7 with certain types of frames where if you tried to call a function from the other frame, apply didn't work and call only worked up to 32 arguments. So, you know, go figure. And I don't remember what exactly it was. We, we tracked it all down. We needed to build this, you know, instead of apply call with up to 32. So this is at least a little bit better than that. Um, all right. So now listen to 
also part of events, is sort of the inversion of control um, version of on. So it uses on internally, as you can see right there, but it keeps track also from the other side. So, so you can conceptually write, you have model.on change do this. Now the model is where the bookkeeping is happening there. Um, but the do this might be a function on the view to re-render or to do something else. So you might want to keep track of it so that you can then unbind later, keep track from the other side of the chain, keep track from the view side. So view.listen to model change, right? And so basically all that we're doing is we're, we're saying what is the object that we're listening to and let's make an ID for that object and keep track of, keep a reference to that object so that we can then um, unbind it in a moment. On the next slide I'll show you that. And so once is the same sort of pattern where we do the underscore dot once wrapping to ensure the function is only ever called one time and we tell it to undo the listening that first time that it's called. So the useful thing about doing listening to is that when you stop listening, um, you can call it from the right side. So why would you ever want to do stop listening? Um, if you have a view and the view is listening to five or six different models and then the view is destroyed, so you want to get rid of the view. In order to prevent memory leaks or, or uh, events happening that, that you don't need anymore because the view is no longer relevant, you'd have to go through to those five or six different models and unbind those listeners. Now with stop listening, you don't have to do that because you can just say view.stop listening and all of those models that it had kept in that, kept track of, it will just go through and unbind all of those events and get rid of them. So that's sort of the idea here. For, for var ID and listening to, it looks up those objects and then it calls off. And you see how it calls off passing um, the, the callback if one exists, but the callback might, might not if you didn't specify it. But the, the important thing there is this as that third argument. So basically it's saying for everything that I'm bound to, everything that I've set up in the first place, unbind all of those events. And so that's, that's pretty handy. Um, next up after events is uh, backbone models. So models are sort of the, the core of uh, your data layer for backbone. And uh, getting started with them, the important thing to note about sort of the constructor and how models are set up is the order in which things are done. Because this is not necessarily obvious, although hopefully it is. So first, the attributes are parsed out um, if, with your parse function and defaulted to their default values. And then they're set. So your initial attributes, when you first create the model and you pass in data, those are set before initialize is called. So when you have your initialize function and you're doing your, your initial setup, all of your data is already there. Your attributes are already ready. And it could be the other way around. There's some use cases both ways. But this is, I think, a little bit more useful generally. So model basics, these are things you can override. Um, to JSON in JavaScript is a method with a pretty terrible name because it doesn't actually give you JSON, right? The idea is it, it was sort of a, a Crockford spec. Um, to, to JSON is a function that you should return what you would like to be serialized into JSON. So in this case, we return a clone, a shallow clone of the attributes of the model is considered to be its JSON representation. If you want to do something special, that's fine. You just override to JSON and return the JSON serializable object that you'd like to have. Um, and then the same thing for sync. It's just a hook that exists so that you can override sync at a model level. So you can say, my, this type of model is special. It doesn't go to my usual API endpoint. It goes somewhere else, and I want to override it um, and, and do my other thing. And so fundamentally, a model is sort of um, the enhanced change framework around a basic key value object. And so get is just the simple function for looking up the attributes in your attributes hatch. And there's a little bit of indirection there so that you have the symmetry between get and set um, so that we can do the events when attributes change. Um, and then a model is considered to have a value if, if uh, to have an attribute if the value of that attribute is not either null or undefined. So this is something that some folks don't know. About JavaScript, um, we get, that's probably the number one most frequent reopened constantly uh, ticket to, I guess, a lot of things, including Backbone, but CoffeeScript especially, where not equals to null is actually checking against both null and undefined. If it was not equals equals, it would just be null, but not equals to null is null and undefined both. Um, so that's good. Little tip. Um, now, set is really the the most fun uh, hairy part of, uh, of model. So when you're setting attributes, we have to go through, we have to um, put them in, we have to validate if we're going to validate, and we have to figure out what the changes are and what has changed. And now this is actually a little more um, complicated than one might think. Uh, 
because um, you're dealing with, so basically the idea with backbone um, events is that they're synchronous, so that you have nice ordered behavior where if you call set on a model and you have listeners listening for changes and reacting, on the next line after you've called set, you can depend on the fact that all of your changes have been applied. Everything that's listened has reacted by that point. You don't have to wait for another event loop to run or anything like that. Um, so there's actually a bit of tricky bookkeeping because you can have a model set call that, that then uh, something listening to that change calls set again on the model inside of that set call and so on. You know, ad infinitum, hopefully not because then your browser hangs up. But uh, it, can, it, can, it can go more than one level deep. So we have this changing flag to say, are we in the middle already of a change cycle? Are we already more than one level deep? Because if we're more than one level deep, we don't want to start from scratch with our previous attributes. Our previous attributes are still, you know, we, we keep a reference to them and we just basically keep on building up. The, fur the more deep you go and the more and more nested change events you have, we keep building up what the diff is from the previous state until you stop. And at the time that you stop, all of that gets flushed back up. So the basic idea here is you go through all the attributes being passed in to be set on the model. And if the two aren't the same, using underscore equality, so that underscore dot is equal sort of a deep equality comparison. If they're not the same, then uh, we say that that attribute has changed, and we, and we push it into that list of things that have changed, and then we keep going. So in part two, this is the rest of the function. Um, once we've sort of built up that changed list, we need to trigger our events. So first we do the um, specific events. So we say that this attribute has changed, and this, so that's change colon attribute. Um, and that's where all of those changes are triggered. And then um, there's, you can see this pending bit. So then we say if we're not doing a silent set, and um, the while this dot pending is what I just talked about um, with the nested loops. So basically, as long as, as, long as the, this dot pending is still set, as long as we're still deep within a nested change, we don't want to have, so basically the idea is you can have many nested changes together. We only want one change event at the end of all of those things to be fired. We don't want to keep, every time you step back out, we don't want to fire multiple change events for the same thing just because you happen to have it go together. So while this dot pending is true, we haven't made it all the way back out of that list yet. Um, and so we, we avoid firing it. And then at the very top level, we trigger that change and say, all right, that cycle has completed. You have a change. Here's your old diff. Here's your new set. And you can keep going. So that's the fun little uh, nasty bit of doing. So if you didn't do synchronous changes, this wouldn't be um, so much of an issue because you wouldn't be able to know about it until it had already happened. But here you can, you can mess with it in the middle of it happening. Um, so the sort of the, the um, sister functions to set are unset, which is simply a call to set again. So one thing that Backbone tends to do is to implement its primitives sort of in terms of other things internally. Um, so in the, case of, in the case of unset, it's really just a set, but you happen to set all of the values that you pass to undefined and, and, and or delete them. So it's just an unset true option being passed into set. That'll do it. And then the same thing for clear. So for clear, what we're saying basically is, is we know what our attributes are. This dot attributes, you know, for key in this dot attributes is a list of all the attributes we've ever set. So we just clear all of those out. And then um, has changed is pretty simple. It's just figuring out if there's any change properties at all on the object and then looking up um, if that particular, so changed is that, again, that hash of keys and values that have changed since the last set. And we can just check if it even has that attribute present in the keys. And if it does, then that's something that's changed. And we'll see, you'll see later on how we can use that to implement some other cool things. Um, so going, going further with this idea of models having changed attributes and your app being able to tell what's changed. Um, changed attributes is a function that either returns a list of the, uh, sorry, a, a, a hash of the key value pairs of all the attributes that have changed in your last set, or you can diff it sort of speculatively. You can say, given this set of attributes, how has that changed my model? And that's what that diff does. Um, and then, so that's different than previous attributes, right? So previous is the previous state of your model. Changed is how is it currently changing? Um, and so you can say, all right, I've got my model and I know what the attribute is. What's the last, what's the previous value of that attribute, whether or not it's changed? Um, and give me a copy of the previous state of my model, which is useful for implementing undo if, uh, if that's something that your model needs to be able to do. Going forward, um, the interesting part of uh, models sort of 
So you've got this client side state where you're setting values and you're, and you're reading them and you're using them and then you also want to persist that to the server. So how does that work? Um, basically, when you save a model, you can save it with a fresh set of attributes. You can say dot save and pass in a list of stuff to save. And that stuff um, needs to get set. So you can see how if, if there's attributes passed in and we're not waiting for the server, then we set them right now on the client side. Um, and, and otherwise, we validate them. So validation is sort of the default thing to do if you've defined it for your model on, uh, on attributes. Now, so save has this interesting sort of duality where in the normal case, Backbone is optimistic. Um, and when you save a new set of attributes, it will set that attribute set on the client side and your UI will update and then it will make the request to the server and hopefully that works, you'll get back the success callback. But if you say wait true, if you ask it to wait for the server to respond, then it's a pessimistic update and uh, it will not change your model yet. It will simply make the request to the server and when the server comes back, you can see on the right hand side there, it merges, it, get, it parses the server attributes and it, if, if you're waiting, it'll merge those server attributes into the attributes you want it to save before setting them back on your model on the client side. And so you have sort of optimistic and pessimistic um, options depending on what you want to do and optimistic is the default one. And that's how it's sort of implemented here. So one slightly tricky point of interest is that you'll notice down here, um, if there's attributes and you're waiting, we actually change the model attributes temporarily and then on the other side over here, if there's attributes and you're waiting, we set it back to the original one. Because we have to, so basically for to JSON to work, right? Your to JSON function can be a custom function that uses the, the attributes of your model to um, figure out what to send to the server. So we have to temporarily, during, during just the course of this function, patch in the optimistic attributes so that you can make your JSON representation and send it to the server to be saved. And then we stick back the previous ones at the end of that call so that you're waiting for the server to acknowledge it before they actually get set in that success callback. And that's a little bit of a rigmarole that we do to make that work. So model destroying, um, not super fancy, except the interesting thing here is that we call stop listening by default on the model. So by default, if you've been using listen to on your model to make it listen to whatever it needs to react to, by default, all of its event handlers will be cleaned up when you destroy that model. So that's a nice little quality of life feature. A um, little bit of extras on the model. The way that the URL is determined, so, so backbone models have sort of their restful um, representation. So every model ideally has a URL where it's being put to or um, deleted from or being read from if you're fetching new data from it. And the way that's determined by default is if you've defined a URL root on your model or it gets it from the collection. So if you have different collections of the same type of model that live at different endpoints like for example, authors slash one slash books is a different endpoint than authors slash two slash books. Um, and if the model is new, if the model has never been saved to the server before, its, I, it's a URL is just that base URL where it'll be posted to. It's a sort of a rail style convention where you post to the base URL um, to create a new resource underneath that URL. It'll give you back the ID. And then if there is an ID, um, we have that base URL plus a slash with a little bit of jiggery pokery to make sure we don't get a double slash in there. And then um, the URL encoded ID of the model is, again, that's just a default. So you can override this function and give a model whatever URL scheme you desire. So validation. So um, the first is the, this idea of is new, where a model, we consider a model has not been saved to the server yet if it doesn't have an ID. And that's just our convention. So basically, you know, clients, if, if you're building a robust application, clients can never actually generate IDs. You can't trust the client to generate an ID because it needs to be, you know, something that uniquely identifies your model. Um, so if the model has an ID, then that means that the server has knowledge of it and there's a URL for it on the server and it's been saved to the database. So that's kind of just our convention for whether or not the server has been, the model has ever been saved. Um, it needs to be posted or put or the appropriate or patched or the appropriate option. So validation here is just a little um, convention. They're actually, so, so uh, you'll see there's uh, this.validate call to actually do the validation. There is no validate function in Backbone. We don't define any validation for you, but should you desire to validate your attributes, you can make a validate function that takes in the attributes that you pass in and just returns it, you know, a uh, either false or, a, or an error to, to in indicate that the validation failed and that there's an error you want to display. 
um, on the client side. So we never make a validate function, but that's something you can add yourself if you want to. And then um, there's a bunch of little goodies from underscore that we can proxy into the model prototype and get there. So this is kind of a fun technique. This is useful for many other projects. You know, your own, your own libraries and your own um, applications where you, you have underscore functions that are useful on the data that you're working with and you want to give them a more convenient way than having to call them sort of externally through underscore. So here what we're doing is we're taking all of those methods, those things in a list, and we're sticking them onto the model.prototype, right? We're saying model.prototype dot that particular method is a new function that then applies it against the, um, the model there. And so that's sort of a nice little way to get, to get those, just be able to say, um, you know, book.keys, book.values, pairs, invert, and to work with the attributes of your model. All right, so that's the end of uh, models. And now we can talk a little bit about collections and maybe pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, collections are sort of, they're, they're, really, they're really where your data manipulation um, goes to work with. So models are nice. Having a discrete unit to represent a resource on the server is nice, and having ways to work with it in a rich way are nice. Um, but collections are how you really get sort of the power of working with a set of data. And part of that is that they listen to events on the model and proxy them through. So you have one place you can say, I'm going to listen to this collection. And whenever anything in it changes, whenever any of the models changes the title or something's added or something's removed, or whenever anything happens inside of it, I can just listen in one place and know about all of those changes without having to keep track of a whole bunch of listeners. Um, so the constructor is not too fancy. The interesting thing here is these, is these options here, the set options and the add options. We're going to do that same trick where we use one function to implement sort of two different things. And in the case of set, we'll be adding and removing and merging. If you're setting a new set of models on the collection, you both add models, you remove models, and you merge models with just those options. And then if you're just adding by default, you're adding, but you're not removing. Um, so same kind of setup that you see for models here. You have a to JSON function. By default, it's just a mapped array of all of the models to JSON individually. You can override it. If you have a fancier thing, you need some special um, wrapper around it or whatever. And by default, we have a sync that just uses backbone sync, but you can have a custom sync. And you can see how add here, add isn't its own method, it's just a set with the correct options. So we're saying set, we're going to default merging to false when you're just adding new stuff. But if you want to, you can override that by passing in merge true as an option. So if that is delegating to set, how does set work? So here's the first, this is, this is the, the, biggest, the biggest method in, uh, in all of Backbone is set. So the first part of set here is just sort of getting set up. So basically, what, what, is, what is set in a collection? When you set a new set of models in a collection, you add models to the collection, you remove them, um, you, and you merge models in. You can do this at a particular point in the ordered list that the collection is, or you can do it at the end. You can have the collection sort itself when this happens, or you cannot. And, um, and then you have to trigger all of the events that correspond to all of these adds and removes and changes. So first, we're sort of parsing in the new models, and we're figuring out if there's a position we want to insert them at. We're figuring out if there's a comparator we want to keep this thing sorted. And then we set up this, these lists of models to be added, models to be removed, and uh, a model map so that we can check for duplicates and see if we've already um, seen this model before in this loop. Now, we go through all of the models in the list, and we see if that model, if existing is equals to this.get, we see if that model is already present in the collection. Um, and if it is, and we're merging, then we want to merge in those new attributes. So we call set right there, existing.set attributes options. And now here's this cool thing. Remember I said how has changed would come in handy before? So we just set that, that the new set of attributes on that existing model. Now we say if it's sortable, and we're not using a custom sort function, we have a, uh, a, a comparator property, and the existing model has changed its sort attribute, then we set a sort equals true Boolean flag. So we can check right there. We can say, has the attribute that we care about that the model depends on for its ordering, has that attribute changed after this call? If it has, we know we have to then sort the entire list later on to figure out what the new positions are. So that's just a really neat way of using the bookkeeping to say, if this particular thing we care about has changed, we're going to do this more expensive operation later because we know we have to reevaluate the sort. If we didn't know that, we'd have to just resort every time. Um, and so now if we're adding, then basically we push the model into a list of stuff to be added, and then um, 
sort of the same thing down here for the ordering. We push the model into the into the list of correctly ordered stuff to be added if we have things in an ordered fashion. And now the last part of set, the third and final part, which I hope is at least somewhat legible. So after we've we've uh, called, we've merged in the new attributes, we now remove it, we go through that list of stuff to be removed, and we build, basically we're saying if things aren't present in the list, then th there are things that need to be deleted. And we remove those things. Um, calling this dot remove and then uh, and then we add the stuff after that so if there's a particular position for stuff to be added at we splice it in at that position splice those models in um, one at a time and then if there is not a particular position we just push them onto the end also one at a time so you get your sequence of add events in the correct order um, and then after all of this if we need to sort if sorting is, uh, now, it's now been determined that we have to resort this, this set, then we call, we do our silent sort, and then we start triggering our events. So then we say, if this is, if this is not a silent um, set on the collection, we're going to trigger all of our ads, we're going to trigger, and then we're going to trigger our sort event, and we're going to come back out of there. So the overall um, sequence of things you'll get here, right? So you've just called set, you've passed in a new list of stuff, and you're getting all of these Whoa, you're getting all these changes. Um, so first you're going to get your changes. You're going to get all the models that have changed. Then you're going to get all the models that have been removed. All of those events are going to fire. Then you're going to get all of the additions. And then finally you're going to get your sort. And I'm going to skip over remove. And we'll go to mutators. So um, we need to now implement array mutators for um, collections in sort of in terms of those primitives that we've just established. So pushing because we need to we need to use those primitives so that we get that same behavior of being able to merge if we have to merge or um, or more importantly triggering the events the appropriate events. So pushing into a collection is just an addition at the end of the collection, right? Popping is a removal from the end of the we figure out what the index of the last thing is and we just remove that one. And then unshifting is the reverse. So unshifting is an addition at zero, and uh, shifting is take finding the first thing in the collection and removing it. And then slicing um, is just pulling out a slice of, of models from the middle. So there's locators for sort of looking up things inside of your collection by indexes. Um, one is by, so again, collections are sort of this doubly indexed set of stuff. You have one index is by the ID of the models, and one is the ordering that you've put it into. So get is what gives it to you by ID, and at is what gives it to you by index. And basically, one is just looking up in that in our, in our trackers of either your object's ID, or its client ID, its CID, or its index just in the list. And that's pretty simple. And then where and find where you might be familiar with from underscore, it's give me back models that match where this set of attributes matches uh, the given model. And now sorting, there's a funny little hack in here. So when you sort your, you have a comparator on your uh, collection, your, that comparator can be a property that you want to keep things sorted by, or it can be a sort function, like custom sort function to determine how to sort your collection. And we used to only support um, uh, sort of underscore sort by style comparators where the sort function takes a single argument, which is the model, and it returns back a value that is sort of the position in the list where it should be sorted to. And so we just, it turns out that's not, you know, if you, that's a fine way to sort things for simple cases, but complicated cases, you can't just return a value because it depends sort of on what is next to you. And you have to support the full style sort where you have, you pass in two arguments, one model and the other model, you have to return one if it's great, if, if the first should be in front of the second, negative one or zero, depending on if it should go first, the other one should go first, or if they're both considered to be the same. And so now we have to support both those types of functions, but there's not a good flag for that. So we're, um, most of you probably know that in JavaScript, functions have a length property, and the length of a function is the number of arguments that it was defined to take. It's not super reliable because there's some things you can do to functions like binding them that will change the length of the function. But in this case, um, if you're defining a function in line, we can say if it takes one argument, then it's an underscore dot sort by style function that expects one model. And if it doesn't take one argument, then it's just a regular sort that um, takes two. So that's how that works. And finally, sort of the, uh, the heart of uh, the collection reference tracking is paying attention to what events are going on on all the models in the collection. So when we add a model to the collection, we add a reference. 
um, we listen to all of the events that the model is going to do, all of the changes and all of the change properties and the and the and the destroys and whatever else you might be triggering on your models. And then the same thing on remove reference. So when we're done listening to a model, we take off that all. And then what do we do when the all is called? Well, here's our on model event callback. So basically, when it's being added or removed, and um, and it's a different collection, we don't have to worry about it. Um, but if it's being destroyed, if the model is being destroyed, we that we then automatically remove it from the collection. So you don't have to remove stuff from the collection yourself. When you call destroy on a model, the collection is listening for that, and it takes the model out itself. And then if there's a change, we care about changes in ID. So when the ID changes, we have to update our ID mapping. And so we're listening. We say, oh, has the ID changed? If it has, um, then we need to change that reference there. And then we proxy it through. So basically, whenever any model changes, we trigger that same event on, on this, on the collection itself. And so you can listen from the outside for model changes. Then the last thing in collections is this huge list of uh, underscore functions, which is um, sort of proxied through. So useful things, mapping over collections, filtering collections to find certain models, reducing, um, finding out the minimum by specific criteria value in the collection or the maximum. And um, also, you know, the these things need to be proxied in different ways depending on how they work. So the basic thing is the same as the model where you stick the method onto collection.prototype and you just apply it against the uh, the list of models there. Um, so basic args.unshift list of models is putting that array of models as the context to the underscore function. Um, but there's also a few methods that work not on models directly, but on attributes of the models. And so we have to, to add a, an iterator that goes through to get the attributes for group by, count by, sort by. So if you say model.group by, sorry, collection.group by a property, it's going to go through all of the models and then find that property and do that group. So I think this is actually a pretty cool demonstration of how functional and object-oriented methods don't have to be at odds with one another and how you know it's pretty you can find a real harmony between the two where we have this low level underlying library that's implementing these things in terms of function you know naked function calls against raw arrays and then with a pretty simple proxy you can take that list of stuff and attach it in object oriented fashion to be applied against these internal arrays of uh, of values and really sort of it's not really one or the other you can use the functional techniques um, as methods on your objects in a nice way. Um, and I think this is a pretty cool little demo of that. So I'm running a little bit short on time, but I'm getting quite close. Views are very simple in Backbone. They don't do much. Um, and the best demonstration of that is how in the beginning of the views, your render function does nothing, right? The default render function just returns this. And so the idea is that you're going to use your favorite templating library, whether it's underscore templates or whatever kind of templates, or you're going to use React, or you're going to use whatever the case may be to optimize your, uh, your views and do them the way you want them to do. And uh, a view a view in Backbone is just a, a top-level um, DOM object listening to events inside of it and, and a top-level DOM object for that view that always exists. And it's important that we have ensure element here. It's important that it always exists because that lets you have something to hang on to. It avoids the old jQuery nightmare of, I, I have this thing where I'm binding this click handler and it doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? I can see the elements there, right? I'm binding it. Oh, it didn't exist at the time that you bound the click handler and jQuery just failed silently. You know, We've all had that happen all the time. Um, so the idea is that if you're, for a view, if your element always exists, it never does not exist if the view exists, and you're delegating events always, or at least as much as possible, from that top level, then you're, all of your events always work all of the time, and you never have to worry about that. Um, and they're implemented efficiently because they're being delegated, and they're not being applied to thousands of individual DOM elements. Um, we've got backbone.sync, which is not super fancy, although it is pretty, but it's not super fancy except for um, that fun little method map up in the corner where we're mapping between CRUD and REST and, and our internal terminology here. Um, but sort of the basic idea is that when you create new things that don't exist yet, you're going to be posting them to the server. When you're updating them, you already have a URL and you're putting a new representation at that URL. And then patching is the new HTTP method that's not widely supported yet, but for doing a partial put. Um, and, and we have sort of that mapping right there. 
And then we also have fallbacks for things like emulating HTTP and emulating JSON, which are a little bit pejorative ways to phrase it in terms of arguments. But uh, the idea is that if your server doesn't support fancy methods like put and delete and patch, we can do the override in the header. And if your server doesn't support JSON parsing, we can send it as if it was a form. Instead of serializing it to JSON, we serialize it to a form and send it up. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to touch on is the uh, Backbone router. Just very quickly, the router is sort of a list of, um, of, of regexes that is applied against the URL, and it picks out which one matches and then sends those parts to you. So there's, here's the different kind of parts you can define in your routes. If you're not doing a custom regex, you can have a named one or an optional one or something that soaks up the rest of it. And our regex bashing happens right here, where basically we do this kind of cool thing where that root to regex right there, that takes your, your uh, URL string that you've, had, you've added those little um, sort of parenthesized or, or named colon named parts you want to match, and we turn it into a regex by replacing it with regex syntax and then calling new regex at the end. And you'll notice that the regex is anchored to the beginning and the end of your URL. So you're always going to get a complete match when you have a root. And, uh, and then we, this extract parameters is the inverse thing, where basically then we're mapping the, uh, the parts of your root back into the arguments. Because the regexes that we generated right there have, have parenthesized capture groups, so the first thing it captures is the first argument, the second thing it captures is the second argument, and those match up, those align exactly with the roots that you've defined. Um, and then I think this is the last thing that I wanted to talk about with, um, with backbone history. So most of history is not that super interesting anymore because a lot of it has to do with hash change and um, support for older IEs, and all of that stuff will hopefully be irrelevant and dead soon now that push state is widely supported in browsers are being um, upgraded. But the one really fun, gross hack for old IE, so this is, IE is so old that not even hash change is supported, so there's no, there's, no, there's no push state, there's no real URLs, there's no hash change, you can't tell when the hash has been updated. Um, but you have an iframe, a secret hidden iframe that Backbone is creating for you and writing new little fragment URLs into so that it gets stuck in your browser history so that the back button works properly in IE6 and IE7. And that is a horrible hack that I'm looking very much forward to deleting soon. So uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, I think that was about the 40 minutes that uh, I was supposed to use up. And in terms of uh, what's coming up for Backbone, there's going to be a 1.2.0 out soon. There's not tons of huge changes in it, lots of little bug fixes and quality of life things. The main change is that there's more hooks exposed internally so that people can write plugins that replace um, jQuery with their own non-jQuery style native adapter to get increased speed. So if, if jQuery wrapping is too slow for you because it's not the fastest thing in the world, um, there's, you can replace it with sort of much closer, if you're using modern browsers, much closer to native style method calls and then get a little bit of a speed up with your, with your view handling. And uh, so I appreciate everyone coming out so early in the morning. And the fun thing about this conference is always not so much backbone in itself, because as you just saw, we pretty much did the whole, whole shebang right there. And, uh, and what you guys have done with backbone and what you do you know, day to day with the libraries that you're building goes way, way, way beyond you know, what backbone itself is. So it's not so much about what the library is. You know, we're not coming down from the mountain with new tricks or techniques or performance things you should definitely be doing. It's more about what you've already learned how to do and sharing that with each other and the amazing shit that you guys have uh, have built. I'm always just blown away by the types of things that have been done with it. And I think that's probably a pretty good segue into the guy we have coming up next. So thanks a lot.